All you, Arjewa. All right. So, Shayla, do you want to start? Yes, Anishi. Perfect. Yep. So, hello, everybody. We'd like to thank you for joining us, and we'd like to take a minute to welcome all of you here. And um, as Della had mentioned a minute ago, we'd like to invite all of you to put your name and where all of you are from in the chat. It's always great to see where everyone is joining us from all of the different places um, throughout the state. And honestly, throughout the world, it's been quite interesting to see where everyone is coming from. Um, Workforce Wednesday is a monthly webinar. It's held on the first Wednesday of every month from 11 to 12 noon. And we always have a special unplugged session uh, immediately following the event from 12 to 1230. Um, and just so everyone knows, we are recording um, this event. Um, so that way we can send out the recording and the resources to everyone that has registered. Uh, you can see the entire uh, sessions for the year uh, here on this slide and on the Workforce Wednesday um, web page. Next slide. Um, our Workforce Win our Workforce Wednesday, sorry, our Workforce Strategy Team is currently led by our Interim Director Jessica Miller and um, us as Workforce Strategy Consultants, we work to develop innovative workforce strategy solutions by aligning resources, facilitating collaboration, and leveraging expertise in targeted industry sectors to drive economic equity and growth within Minnesota. Um, we will provide a link to our regional breakdown map and contact information in the chat. And now I'll turn it over to Ada Shewa to start her session. Thank you, Shayla. And just to let you know, our last panelist um, is in the lobby. So if you look out for him. So. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Adeshewa Adesiji. I'm the Deed Workforce Strategy Consultant for the metro area. As Shayla mentioned, we are excited to have you join us today. Um, today's Workforce Wednesday topic will be on biases, microaggressions, and code switching. So by the end of this presentation and panel discussion, we do hope that you gain a better understanding of the three and just start uh, having some ideas on um, how to start the conversations and the discussions in your workplace about biases, microaggressions, and code switching. So as you can see, this is our agenda for uh, today's presentation. Um, we will start with biases and microaggressions. We'll go into isms and phobias, talk a little bit about code switching, uh, intersectionality, uh, employers, things that you can do to combat and tackle um, all of those things. And then we will have a robust panel discussion with four wonderful uh, experts who I will introduce later on in the presentation. Uh, we'll wrap up with some resources and then we'll have our Wednesday, Workforce Wednesday unplug uh, session. So during our presentation, um, only the workforce strategy consultants and the panelists, the cameras and microphones will be on. Um, as Shayla mentioned, um, at noon when we have our unplugged, that's when the audience will be able to ask the panelists and or um, our workforce strategy consultant team questions related to this topic. So let's begin. So what are biases and microaggressions? I think that it's it's good to start with just a mutual understanding of what these are. Biases are a natural nat natural inclination for or against an idea, object, group, individual, uh, a disproportionate weight favors for or against um I'm sorry, let me start over. <laughs> Biases I'm sorry, I'm reading something different. Biases is a natural inclination for or against an idea, object, group, or an individual. Microaggressions are daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental slights, whenever intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative attitudes towards stigmatized or culturally marginalized groups. Now, usually you can find biases and microaggressions both during the recruiting process and then within the workplace with uh, current employees. But I would like to think that you would see more of the biases during the front end with the recruiting and the microaggressions during um, during within the workplace while people are actually working within the company. I'm 
I'm sorry, I'm just not seeing. Okay, so you know we know that biases exist in the workplace. So the most common biases are implicit or what we call unconscious biases. So implicit or unconscious biases um, are a form of biases that occur automatically or unintentionally that affects judgment, decisions, and behaviors. The op opposite is explicit, explicit biases, which are the, considered the traditional conceptualization of biases. So individuals are aware of their prejudices and attitudes towards certain groups. Um, biases in the workplace can take many forms, but the result is always the same. Parts of the workforce are unfairly excluded from experiences and opportunities for which they are qualified. So some of the most uh, common work, workplace biases include like affinity biases, you know, and a conscious tendency to get along with others who are like us. You have perception biases, the tendency to form stereotypes and assumptions about certain groups that make it difficult to make an objective judgment about an individual or members of a particular group. You have confirmation biases, uh, seeking out evidence that confirms our initial perceptions, ignoring contrary information. And then you have the halo effect, the tendency for positive impressions of a person to reflect positively or influence judgments and opinions uh, in other areas. So putting them on a pe pedestal, basically. And then you have attribution biases how we assess behavior. When something good happens to us, we believe that is all our doing. When something bad happens, we blame it on external factors. So as you can see, when you compare implicit for explicit biases, those are the differences. So microaggressions, as I mentioned, you know, occur, um, occur in the workplace. You know, we might view, you know, as our, you know, our, we might view it as our right to an opinion you know, or action, you know, might have different effects to those on the receiving end. So what I have here is a list of some examples. I mean, there's plethora of uh, examples of micro bias or microaggressions that can happen in the work that I have witnessed and in my research I've came across. So for example, you know, not belonging, some of the things that would be said, where are you from? Where were you born? Oh, you're so interesting looking and what that means. You can have assumption based on intelligence or based on race or uh, gender. You know, you are a credit to your race. I'm sure people have heard that before. You have color blindness. You have, um, when I look at you, I don't see color, which is very irritating um, personally. Um, or there's only one race, the human race. You know, really uh, downplaying the differences that should be celebrated with us. Um, you have styles and ways of communicating. Why are you so angry? You know, if you're an African-American woman like myself, um, you've probably come across that black angry woman, you know, stereotype. Or you speak so well, you're so articulate. Um, it's, you know, really being surprised that someone is able to speak well and be very understanding. So um, you have assumptions based on gender. You know, I thought lesbians didn't like wearing makeup. You know, saying something as even if it's jokingly, you know, that can be seen as microaggression um, because what you're basically saying is that, you know, what you're seeing doesn't align with what your thoughts or what you think should be appropriate or is, you know, correct for society. So microaggressions. So it's important to acknowledge biases and microaggressions in the workplace. You know, if you're an employer, biases and microaggressions can affect your ability to hire and retain candidates, you know, who are the best fit for your workforce. So here's some other uh, effects. And once again, um, on recognizing, you know, that biases and microaggressions occur and why it's important to recognize those and what are the effects of those. So bias and microaggressions can affect the decisions of managers and leadership. Biases and microaggressions can affect feelings of inclus inclusiveness. Biases and microaggressions can affect employees' productivity and overall morale. Microaggressions can contribute to a hostile and invalidating work environment. Biases can affect the candidate process and eliminate the best candidates. Microaggressions can devalue group identities. Uh, biases can impact someone's ability to move forward on the leadership track. 
Microaggressions can create physical health problems, uh, depression, anxiety, insomnia. Microaggressions can affect one's mental health due to stress. Microaggressions can affect employee turnover rates. My, uh, biases and microaggressions can go against psychological safety. You know, psychological safety is the belief that you won't be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, or concerns or mistakes. So, you know, basically looking at these, um, having biases, microaggressions um, in the workplace does affect, does affect uh, retention, does affect the morale. Um, and it will increase the, the chances of an employee leaving that work environment if they feel like, you know, they are facing microaggressions or biases every day in the workplace. So recognizing that you have biases and microaggressions are important in order to uh, retain your workforce. So is this, an, uh, we, you know, is this and folios are a catalyst for biases and microaggressions in, in the workplace. You know, they are discriminatory and of, often hostile beliefs and behaviors based on stereotypes, fear, and ignorance. So what we, we have some commonly known isms, as I like to call it. So you have racism, sexism, classism, ageism, heterosexism, ableism. But we're seeing that there are new isms coming. Uh, coming up in our entering the workplace. And some of those include tokenism, colorism, sizeism, cis sexism, and elitism. And so some of these newer isms um, are just as damaging and can have the same effect as commonly known isms. Uh, bottom line is isms and phobias are things that um, lead to biases and microaggressions and um, are not needed in the workplace. So how did we get to biases and microaggressions? Um, in order for us to understand what biases and microaggressions are, we need to look at the root. What is the root of those biases and microaggressions? So what you see here is kind of a family tree, um, which outlines you know, how can you get to those biases and microaggressions? So for example, power and prejudice come together to create isms or phobias. You have willful avoidance or um, lack of knowledge or information coming together to create ignorance. And when you combine the isms and phobias with the ignorance, then you come with biases and microaggressions. So basically, bio, biases and microaggressions are a combination of power, prejudice, willful avoidance, and um, lack of knowledge or, or, or information. So within my presentation, I like to include some quotes which support uh, the topic of this discussion. And so I found one on intersectionality. There is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. This is a quote from, Af from an African-American writer, Audre Lorde. So originally coined by American lawyer, scholar, and activist Kimberly Crenshaw, intersectionality is the interconnection of social cat categories. So race, class, gender, language, ability, there's um, multiple different categories, um, but can be combined. Applied to an individual or group, it creates an overlapping and interdependent system of discrimination or disadvantage. So in other words, experiencing biases and microaggressions from multiple ang uh, angles. So this pie chart shows just a few of those categories, as I mentioned, you know, other categories that um, are not included, but could lead to biases and microaggressions include social or economic status. So your occupation, uh, a newer one, being a parent versus being child free. There's biases and microaggressions that people receive um, from that political affiliation. Are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? Um, and re religious beliefs. Are you a Christian, a Muslim, Jewish? Are you an atheist? You know, these different aspects of an individual's identity can intersect together and compound uh, disparities. You know, the truth is we're multidimensional beings. And so, um, example, you know, if you have a white, non-Hispanic, Latino, single mom, um, not a high school graduate working full time, two full time entry level jobs, you can see that there are different categories that 
they fit in, which could lead to some form of biases or microaggressions against them. And once again, for employers, this is very detrimental to uh, recruiting, you know, the best talent and also retaining your current workers if they are facing biases and microaggressions due to um, fitting in multiple categories like this. So now let's get to code switching. So Dave Chappelle is one of my favorite uh, comedians, and I remember uh, he was on the, inside the actor studio and he had made this quote, every black American is bilingual, all of them. We speak street vernacular and we speak job interview. So um, if you are an African-American person as myself, you do understand that um, just in today's workforce, you do have to be bilingual. You do have to sometimes cold switch. And it's not only just for African-Americans, this can go for you know, other groups as well. So what is cold switching? Code switching is a way in which a member of an underrepresented group consciously or unconsciously adjusts their language, syntax, gram grammatical structure, behavior, and appearance to fit into the dominant culture. Uh, code switching uh, derives from linguistic profiling. So linguistic profiling is the analysis of a person's speech or writing, especially to assist in identifying or categorizing individuals or subgroups. You know, those who speak with a standard accent may be viewed as more intelligent, uh, competent, credible, and hireable. Those with non-standard accents can be viewed, you know, as uh, the opposite. So the likelihood of code switching occurs when there's little representation from that group in the company. You know, li linguistic code switching is mostly used with bilingual and multilingual communities, and there are reasons to use um, to use this method, method, such as the need to fit within a group, you know, or force a habit, or to convey thoughts and concepts that might be, you know, easier to explain in a specific language. You know, in the end, code switching can cause the inability for someone to be their authentic self at work. So. Um, for example, you know, this is could qualify as code switching. Someone using a middle name or a nickname um, instead of their first name because it sounds more professional. Or um, you've heard, um, you know, if someone hasn't met you yet and you have uh, a first name that might be too ethnic, using the first initial and then your last name. Um, but, you know, these on this slide, these show some of the different uh, ways that people code switch, you know, your style of speech, your appearance, your behavior, your actions, your thoughts, and your opinions. And so when it comes to code switching and trying to um, fit into the dominant culture, you know, we have to ask ourselves, what is considered the dominant culture? Is there a dominant culture? Um, some people look at it as uh, white Western, um, you know, culture as being the dominant culture, you know, what that does is that prohibits people, like you said, from being their authentic self. Someone that doesn't speak English without an accent or even speaks English, but maybe with a Southern jaw and doesn't speak proper English, um, as we would say, could fate would think about code switching in the workplace, you know, to avoid biases, microaggressions, having uh, people ha uh, put them into groups or categories based on that. So, you know, it's really important as an employer to make sure that this is not going on in addition to the biases and microaggressions that people feel like they um, don't need to code switch. So, you know, unfortunately, code switching um, to belong doesn't always lead to feelings of acceptance. So what we have is a list of why does it happen and what are the consequences of code switching? You know, why does it happen? There's a need to adjust communication style to align with peers. Some of the consequences include there's a fear of being viewed as unprofessional by peers. Um, why does it happen? Um, potential opportunities for career advancement. You know, some of the uh, consequences and one of the consequences, limitations to career advancement. Uh, what I did, if you look on the left hand side from just research, um, I decided to put in quotes 
from people that have experienced code switching and their thoughts on it. Um, I'm not trying to act like other members of my racial group. I go out of my way to make sure I don't appear lazy because I know the stereotypes. In my actions and verbal communications, I try to avoid any opportunity for someone to label me as I'm in a constant battle of censoring, watering down my views, thoughts, and personality for the possibility of being looked at differently. I find myself constantly trying to be aware of my mannerisms to ensure that I don't portray myself or the people I represent in a negative light. Uh, you should be allowed to keep your name, but slang and nappy hair are unprofessional in the workplace. Uh, last, but definitely not least, is exhausting navigating in an all white workspace. So cold switching is very serious and it does, you know, lead to burnout, burnout from the employee and increases the chances of that employee finding uh, employment elsewhere. And as the employer, you want to make sure that your environment is inclusive and is welcoming no matter what category your worker fits into. So what can you do to combat biases, microaggressions, uh, and the need to code switch? Now, of course, this list could be over 10 slides, but for the sake of time, I just pinpointed and only uh, included a few. So what are some of the things that you can do, uh, employers? First, self-assessment. What biases and microaggressions do you have? You know, there's that saying that, you know, make sure that your house is in order before you make sure another house is in order. Do you have any biases and microaggressions that you are applying in the workplace? And is that affecting your ability to hire the best talent or to retain your good workers? Invest in training staff and leadership to become more aware of workplace biases and microaggressions. There's trainings that are found online. There's also uh, consultants and organizations that can assist with um, the training and really starting that discussion on identifying and how to eliminate as much as possible those biases, microaggressions, and code switching. Accountability from managers and leaderships. Leadership, account, uh, managers and leadership need to be held account, accountable for the culture of the workplace. If the culture of the workplace is one that's hostile, if there is a large turnover and this is the reason, then the managers, I say managers, but it's managers and leaders, leadership uh, needs to be aware of that and be held accountable. Um, they say that people don't leave jobs, they leave managers and leadership, so. Perform workplace culture audits. That should be something that's routine. Make sure that you uh, have a pulse on the culture in your workplace. Once again, is it inviting? Is it inclusive? Um, do workers feel like they belong? Um, you know, we always talk about diversity, but diversity, equity, and inclusion are all three of those pieces positive in the workplace. Create a culture of trust for your employees. If your employees uh, see that there is an issue and have an issue and feel like there are biases, microaggressions, or that pressure to code switch to fit in, are they comfortable enough and is there the opportunity for them to speak to a manager or leadership about this concern so something can be done about it? Set expectations of conduct in the workplace. Let it be known up front. This is what will not be tolerated. And so when you set those expectations, anyone that doesn't fit into those expectations um, need to find work elsewhere. And I know that in this market, uh, we are in a candidate driven market where there are more opportunities than candidates. Well, I would like for employers to think of it this way. Would you rather lose one employee that is contributing to negative biases and microaggressions and code switching in the workplace or save, keep that employee in your job and risk losing 10 to 15 other employees because they feel like that environment is so hostile. Uh, including ideas for dealing with biases and microaggressions and DEI strategies. That's the big thing now everyone wants to, and, and, and we're happy about that, focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Include a promise to eliminate or at the very least significantly decrease the biases and microaggressions and the need to co-switch. Have that included in your strategies. And that is something that it doesn't matter if you're a small employer, medium employer, or a large, 
larger employer, um, those are ideas and things that you could include in your strategies. Uh, once again, allow and encourage everyone to be their authentic self. Um, I said it before and I say it again, when people are allowed to be themselves and have no worries about facing biases, microaggressions, and need to co-switch, you're going to have a happier employee, an employee that's going to want to stay, and you can, uh, in the end, retain your workforce. All right, so with that, we'll go to our panel discussion. Um, so let me introduce the four wonderful panelists that have took time out of their busy schedules to talk to us about this topic. So first, I'd like to introduce Lauren Hunter. If she wants to wave. Uh, Lauren Hunter is the Associate Director of External DEI Partnerships at United Health Group. Uh, as a leader on the global DEI team at UHD, uh, Lauren leads the DEI partnership strategy for the company. This includes fostering strategic DEI relationships, both internal and external, and leveraging those partnerships to convert diverse candidates to new UHD employees. So welcome, Lauren. Thank you for being here. Uh, next, we have Sarah Peterson. Sarah Peterson has worked at General Mills for 23 years, focusing on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging for the last 16. Uh, her experiences include regulatory and compliance efforts, learning and development, mentoring, employee networks, and communications. Uh, outside of her day job, she uh, volunteers at her local Y, teaching yoga, and enjoys relaxing with family, reading, walking, gardening, baking, and traveling. That is a lot. I need to be more active like that. So thank you, Sarah, <laughs> and welcome. So next we have Dr. Lanise Block, who is founder and CEO of Sancor Consulting. So Sancor Consulting was founded in 2017 with the aim of serving uh, her community or the community as a leader in design thinking, strategic planning, equity, and inclusion. She is also a professional educator who has been devoted to the ideas of social justice, service, inclusion, and digital innovation. So welcome, Lenise. Last but not least, we have Mr. Alex Tittle. Uh, Alex Tittle is the Senior Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Medica. Uh, in his role, he's responsible for the strate strategy, execution, and administration uh, program performance and communication related to Med Medica's diversity, equity, and inclusion activities. Uh, he's also tasked to build and improve community relationships with the organization. So he has over 24 years of education, human resources, diversity, equity, inclusion, culture, and change management program experiences with government, nonprofit, and private organizations. Um, he has held senior roles for Christiana Care Health Systems, Hennepin County. He was part of the NFL Super Bowl host committee. Um, and then the Minnesota Sports Facilities Authorities or the Vikings, which I'm like, wow, that's that's impressive. So uh, he served um, some years um, in the U.S. Army. He received his bachelor's degree from the uh, Citadel and a drill master's degree from Webster University in Human Resources and Management. So with that, um, that is a lot that is, you know, very robust, very experienced, knowledgeable uh, panel. So once again, thank you very much for being a part of this discussion. Uh, and with that, let me start with the questions. So this first question is for everyone, for all four of you. So any of you could uh, chime in and go ahead and, and answer. Um, how do biases, microaggressions, and code switching impact today's workforce in your in your opinion oh you're on mute alex said so not all at once right we're all yeah. <laughs> we're, we're all four of us are playing double dutch right now so yeah. thank you so much i say what um and everyone for taking time out of your all of your schedules to to listen to us to listen to the deed put on this amazing uh, forum about um microaggressions and code switching and the like um 
And I would be re re refrain if I didn't mention Happy Black History Month to everyone as it is the first day of February. Um, you know, this topic is huge. This topic is huge to a lot of us, if not all of us. Um, the question about how do biases and microaggressions uh, impact today's workforce is tremendous. It's powerful. And the reason why it's powerful, because, you know, we got to take a, a strong look at what microaggressions basically means, right? And as I say, we kind of explained it. It's really about covert versus overt racism or discrimination or 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 any type of discrimination um, that's out there right and so we are responsible as leaders we are responsible as as, uh, as workplace um, um, um employees to recognize and address them right um they impact us because you know uh what i've learned is that there you know i've met there are various types types of microaggressions one you've got micro assaults two you've got micro insults and three you've got micro invalidations right i could go for days talking about each of them but the bottom line is is that these are covert ways to kind of infect an organization with assumptions about who people are and if they're not addressed they can exacerbate and they can grow and they can possibly be uh, taught to employees as a method of engagement which could be a cancer to our, all of our organizations Thank you, Alex, for referring to it as an as a cancer and a disease and something that is um, viral and and, and dangerous. Because I totally agree with that. That microaggressions I and mean, biases are affecting our our country, our world in very detrimental ways. We see have seen it played out in many in very recent incidents and throughout our history. Um, and it's, sometimes it's a matter of life and death relating to various forms, the, depending on the workforce, right? In areas where people in the workforce where people are dealing with things that are um, related to people livelihoods to people's lives right when the people when there we are seeing that biases and microaggressions are there it becomes an urgent matter um and often very dangerous when those things exist and so to the extent that we all should be addressing and understanding i like the slide you had um about the power of prejudice and willful ignorance and lack of knowledge and information all of those things must be addressed to kind of feed down to that tree the root of, of all of this um so i think it's very important that we that it is um understood that this is a a matter of urgency um and that this is a it is a disease a, a virus if you will and it's dangerous a little bit they can go next um, hi everyone. Uh, again, Lauren Hunter with United Health Group. And as Alex started off, um, happy Black History Month. Um, in terms of microaggressions, code switching, um, bias, at my fellow panelists mention it, it definitely is a cancer. I think um, code switching is the result of the bias and the preconceived assumptions and microaggressions that happen um, that are often faced by a group of people, uh, in, and it happens in the workforce as well. Um, people tend to code switch because of a stigma that's associated with that particular group of people. Um, and I, I thought the introduction introductory presentation was amazing in terms of breaking down these terms um, and how they show up from the standpoint of how it impacts our workforce. Um, you see that employees of a certain marginalized group uh, feel like they can't bring their full authentic selves to work. Um, so they're showing up every day trying to be something that they're not, and that is extremely exhausting. Um, and a, as a result, you see people staying for six months to a year and saying, I don't want to play this game anymore. I'm, I'm going to self-select and take myself out of this, and they leave. And so as a result, you see that high turnover that happens because of um, how these things are showing up. Um, and then also, we know that diverse teams are more uh, creative, but when you are masking that creativity, then it's it impacting the services that you're providing, the um, product that you're selling, because there's less creativity. 
Um, and then finally, just again, that suppressing yourself, so not really showing up as who you are. Um, and again, that's exhausting. As a Black woman, I've experienced that before, um, where I am trying to mask who I am and not bring my full self. And as a result, I would get home at night and just be so exhausted because I was switching constantly. And so um, all of those things can have a significant impact to the workforce. The only thing I'll add is one thing that we have noticed since coming back into a new hybrid world is that a lot of our employees, the impact is that they don't want to come into the office. Um, so COVID gave some relief to the everyday microaggressions. And one employee said, it's like I had developed a callus and during COVID that that skin had gotten all soft again. I don't want to go back in the office and develop that callus again. So I want to work from home because I, I'm faced with many less microaggressions. And so when we think about the impact, it's it, it's everything everybody said. And if you want to build a culture and if you want employees to be there, you have to make sure that the workforce and the environment you're creating um, is going to be one in which they don't have to feel like they're protecting themselves or a code switching. Um, and so I think that is one impact that we have seen. Thank you. Thank you. So, so once again, this is um, for everyone. You know, how can employers normalize the discussion on biases, microaggressions, and code switching? You know, a lot of time that's a topic that um, managers and in, in leadership avoid. So, how can how can you make those discussions normal and and um, you know happen or occur on, on a regular basis or as needed? Um, to to combat biases and microaggressions and cold switching. So how can employers normalize the discussion? That's tough. That's tough because every organization doesn't have that safe space. And I know later on we could probably talk about how to create safe spaces uh, for our employees. However, as DE&I professionals and basically human resource um, enthusiasts and professionals, it's our responsibility to open the door for discussion, to create, to, re, to, to, to pull down those walls so that folks don't have to code switch and not be uh, encouraged to bring their authentic selves, as Lauren stated so eloquently. Um, I think the first thing I'd say was that we must do uh, is define what it means. Because it's so subtle, it's so sinister, it's so, you know, I, I'm, I, I have great intentions about what I'm trying to do. And, and, and it's so quickly a, a knee jerk reaction for communities to just m respond with, I, I meant well, I didn't mean to, right? And so it, it's important to define it and to secondly, call it out when it happens. For example, I know when I delivered training to my company a few months ago, one of the things that we found to be uh, uh, groundbreaking was one, when we established that ground rules, because you guys know how to do that, right? Submit those ground rules. This is how we're going to engage in this discussion. The first thing we'd said was, if something bothers you, if something didn't feel right, just say, ouch. Just say, ouch. What this does is it kind of stops the conversation a little bit allows folks to bring their authentic voice to the table, the value of their perspective to the table, so folks can understand. One thing is for certain, we don't always have perspective of the other person that we're speaking to or the people that we're speaking to. We have this idea, this island mentality that my perspective should be assumed to be understood by everyone, and that's never the case. We all are unique to whatever degree of intersectionality we bring to the table, um, um, to the table. So it's critically important, I believe, that we define and we call it out. And I honestly believe that's how we um, how, how we address it, how we normalize the discussions around this. I agree. I think that one of the ways to make that take that a little further um, is to to bake it in. There's a, um, a phrase that says people um, respect what you inspect, right? So meaning that things that you value, um, you establish criteria around, and that's what things that people start to make. That's what, how you normalize things. So one of the things that I encourage um, companies, organizations to do is as they're making their, you know, equity policies, promises, 
um, um, frameworks is to build those things in. And then as people start to, to, to determine what are the goals, the strategies, all those things, they can determine also some of them may define those things and establish protocols for when there's things that, that show up, when there's microaggressions or biases or when people are feeling that ouch that was described. And what does that look like? What does that feel like? And what happens when that occurs? And establish a, a regular sort of way for people to engage in that. And how does that look? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? And just make it a little more um, concrete and pragmatic. I think that helps schools a long way um, to making it natural and normalized. One thing I can say that we have done to help normalize the discussion is use storytelling. And so I can think back into 2018 when we had a large a group discussion about uh, microaggressions. And I can still remember there were six panelists and I remember each of their stories. Um, and they ranged from managers to directors to vice presidents in our company sharing how they had experienced microaggressions. And it, it became OK then to start talking about it because you saw people of all different levels of all different backgrounds sharing their experience and saying this does happen here. Let's not hide it. Um, and I'm going to share with you how it impacted me. And again, I can still as was 2018. I can still remember those stories. And I think a lot of people who were there still do um, because we were given permission. Um, to admit it was happening, to talk about it, and to then start finding ways to address. So I think storytelling can be a really impactful way to help normalize the discussion. I would just um, add that, I mean, I think all of the recommendations are just amazing when we talk about normalizing. Um, Dr. Block, I, I like that you mentioned baking it into the culture and into the policies. I think that that's so important. Um, I feel like you can have discussions all day long, but until you actually start putting it on paper, writing it into policy, um, and and um, having actual like procedures around how you do this, um, I think that's when it become normalized. So I, I, I agree. I think we need to get past talking. I feel like we've talked a lot about these topics, but how do we go to the next step and actually put them into practice, create policies around them? Um, I think that's that's when we begin to normalize. Thank you. You know, I just want to say a couple of things. Dr. Block, I like the people respect what you inspect. So I'm gonna start using that. <laughs> I'm gonna, as we say, I'm gonna permanently borrow that. Um, <laughs> Alex, I had a question for you, or, or Mr. Tittle, I had a question for That's you. That's fine, please, um, Alex. Alex, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, you had mentioned safe space, um, creating a safe space. Do you feel like um, the difficulty, I guess size, of the company is a factor when developing the, the safe space. You know, a, ma a majority of businesses in Minnesota identify as small to medium. So they're not as big a, a, as Medica or as big as UH, UHG or as um, General Mills. Um, and so, yeah, you know, do you, do you think that a smaller to medium sized business would have more difficulty and more challenges in creating a safe space? Or do you think it's the same amount of, of challenge with you know a big a larger company would have i i normally and having had the opportunity to work for companies that were hundreds of thousands of people to now companies that are less than five thousand people it's about culture right um, every organization is at a certain stage in their journey and to kind of go back to Lauren's statement about meeting people where they are and recognizing them for the to, to be their authentic selves. I think it's I think it's 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 important to recognize that every company is at a certain point in their journey of acceptance. Right. Um, you know, at Medica, we require all of our executives to take the individual development inventory, the IDI, right? Because it's, you know, how do you know where you're going if you don't know where you are? That type of thing. Um, as my, my one of my favorite poets, Rock Kemp, it ain't fret where you're from, it's where you're at, right? Um, yeah. and, 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 and my company has recognized that they have to look inward before they go outward. So to create that safe space, it starts with the individual employee. However, the accountability model, if we're looking at it from a racy perspective, is up to the leader. So my CEO holds all of his leaders accountable to creating safe space for our employees. 
I create the vehicles to help influence that. However, every leader at every level, if it's a unit or it's a team of 10 people, five people, or if it's a department of a thousand people, you know, you have to create that space to where it's okay to speak your piece, speak your mind respectively and respectfully and, um, 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 you know, uh, giving your perspective on the topic. So, so, so we create those touch points, those, 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 those ad hoc meetings in the military, we call it a hip pocket training where we sit down and we meet with folks on the, at the cubicle and just check in on them. Are you feeling safe? How are things going at home? Those types of things that develops that individual understanding and assurance, because if I'm just a number out of say, how in a ham sandwich am I going to understand, you know, that you care and that you want to change my environment for the better? If I'm just a number, you're going to make those assumptions and I'm going to have to be that robot, ergo, have to code switch when I communicate with you, right? I can't be myself. When I'm when I'm in environments where I can't speak the same language I speak when I'm at home, but if my leader doesn't respect it and understand it, we're out there flapping. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So so what I'm getting so what I'm getting from you is yes, you know, I mean it doesn't matter if you're a smaller business or a medium sized business or a larger larger business. This is something that can be done. Creating that that safe space, starting those conversations is something that can happen. But it's a key word that you mentioned when you did your overview, accountability. Yeah. If, we, if we don't require it, if we don't put it in place and measure it or recognize it and, and remind leaders of it, it's going to go into the back because it's not normal yet. It's not normal. I mean, we just start talking about xenophobia and racism and saying the word white people and black people in the workplace. We just start doing that like over the past 10 years. Think about it. We've got a lot of repair to do as DEI professionals to do in the workplace, right? So folks haven't normalized it yet, but once we start to require it and hold ourselves accountable, that's when it, that's when we'll start to see the dial change. Thank you. So um, I know that uh, when people are registering, there's a couple of uh, questions um, that they had about allyship and being an ally. And so this leads me to um, the one of the questions and the um, that I sent to the group. So it makes sense when thinking of DEI leaders in this space, an individual associated with the BIPOC community comes to mind. So for someone passionate about DEI outside of those communities, so not only BIPOC, but you know other communities as well that are facing uh, biases and microaggressions. Um, what advice could you give to them about navigating the waters, about being an ally? Like, what is allyship? What does that mean? You know, it's more than just a word. It's more than, you know, a box you can check off. Um, what does it mean to be a true ally in this space and work towards eliminating biases, microaggressions, and the need to code switch? And I'll open this up to everybody. <laughs> Don't so let me I, talk again. <laughs> uh, I can share. I thought it was really funny when we got these questions and in parentheses um, after outside the BIPOC community, it said white, straight, middle aged female. And I looked at the panel and I said, is this directed towards me? <laughs> the questions I thought I was like, she probably is going to think it's directed towards her. But no, it was I just it, I, yeah, it's for everybody. You know, I, I can share for me what 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 my learning has been and for me where I really started to see a difference was when I stopped myself and started to do what Alex said look inside before I look outside and really spend time in self-reflection self-reflection asking myself why do I want to ally and so at General Mills we use ally as a verb not a noun because we believe it is all about the acts and what you're doing um, if your goal is to become an ally, likely it might be more performative. Um, so I really had to start with self-reflection. Why do I want to ally? And until I could kind of spend that time and really reflect on what my background is, what I was taught, what are the biases I bring to the table, what are my blind spots, 
where do I need to learn more? Where do I need to spend more time with other people? Where do I need to um, immerse myself? I wasn't able to probably show up as authentically and as effectively in my allyship. Um, and so for me, a lot of it starts with knowing why you want to ally. Um, and then the only other thing I'll say is, because I know there's going to be a lot of great insights from others, is to stay curious. Um, I live in Marshall, Minnesota, and I have Southwest Minnesota State University uh, in town, and I utilize them all the time. They bring in speakers, um, freedom fighters, Holocaust survivors, different theater groups. I go to everyone if I can because I need to make sure that even though I am in a very red part of the state um, and in a town where maybe DEI, um, B, whatever other acronyms you want, is not as popular, that I am making it intentional that I keep learning and putting myself in places where I might not be comfortable. Um, so staying curious and finding those resources of where you can learn is critical. I would say to tag on to what Sarah said, in addition, is I think it's about taking the risk. Doing DEI work, you know, authentically, effectively is can be very uh, trying and risk taking. And those of us who are in, in doing it, you know, perhaps involuntarily by default, i.e. BIPOC people, um, we often don't have a choice. And so the people who are who are opting in, right, um, there's an opportunity to, to make those choices and really take the risk. If you see something, you know, like at the airport, say something. It's it's, something, it's important to be involved and, you know, in, in organizations, excuse me, in meetings when there's something happening, um, you know, say something. I think there's, if there, you see an a, a, a opportunity where there's, you see a bias or a microaggression, don't wait for the BIPOC person to say something. If you see it and notice it, say something, be, be involve yourself in, and be a, take, be a part of taking that risk um, and not relying on only the people who are experiencing it to address what's happening in the space. Okay. All right. No, I, I like that. I like, you know, definitely saying something like that's one of the things is speak up. Don't wait for the person on the receiving end to say something. If you know that, you know, this is not right and that this is something that needs to be discussed, definitely, uh, you know, say that. Um, and then I like, you know, what you had mentioned, Sarah, about bringing in different groups, being able to share their experiences as well. And that might be something, too, is, is just listening from listening and understanding, you know, someone else, what they're going through, what their perspectives are on that could help it with, you know, eliminating those biases, you know, microaggressions and code switching. So I think we have a. Uh, one more question, time for one more question. So once again, this is for the entire group. Um, and I think, you know, we kind of mentioned that a little bit through our throughout our conversations, but I'll still ask the question and if, you know, there's anything to add on to it, um, please do. So what is the cost for businesses of ignoring biases and microaggressions? Uh, uh, cost for businesses and the individuals. If they say, you know what, we just are going to turn a blind eye to biases, to the microaggressions, for people's need to to code switch um, because of intersectionality. Um, you know, uh, people have multiple biases or microaggressions against them. If businesses, if people decide to ignore that, what is the consequence? What is the cost of that? I can I can start on this one. Um, so. For individuals, I think, and I mentioned this before, I think the cost is, um, I mean, you're you're costing yourself. It's exhaustion. It is um, not being able to show up as who you are. It's um, just really not being able to showcase the amazing person that you are. You're not bringing that full self um, to the company. And then I feel like also you are perpetuating some of those stereotypes that could exist by not speaking out, by not saying, hey, that's a microaggression or calling it out when you see it. I think that um, all of those things will are costly for an individual. Stress, um, I, you know, had a friend who was experiencing some of this and she was like losing weight. I mean, it was just really bad. So you are, um, um, you're really costing yourself by not calling these things out. From a business perspective, though, I think that you are um, creating a toxic and non-inclusive culture when you, um, when you're ignoring this, you are uh, allowing this culture to 
perpetuate, allowing the culture of, um, you know, every company says that they want to be inclusive, um, but, you know, when you don't call these things out, then you continue to perpetuate that toxic and non-inclusive culture. And again, high turnover. I think that you will continue to lose people if you aren't normalizing, having these discussions, and really being intentional about creating a culture um, that is inclusive and that allows people to really bring their full self. I would say at UHG, one of the things that we are elevating right now is this idea of psychological safety, um, how what what that means, really defining what that means, um, and uh, you know having these discussions discussions about what it means for, for um, employees, especially our marginalized employees, to um, to really understand this idea of psych psychological safety. So um, I think the more we have these discussions, we'll continue to normalize these, these ideas. I know at Medica, um, you know, we're constantly trying to make the business case for DE&I. We know it's important, but everyone needs to understand it and build it and move it forward. As DE&I practitioners, each of us know that we don't direct or push anything on anybody. However, our main job is to influence. Influence the masses on how to see it through a different vantage point or lens. Um, I mentioned this earlier that if we choose not to address microaggressions and these types of discriminatory behaviors. We create a, uh, an environment of acceptance. We normalize the fact that it's okay to make these little, I'll, I'll say, uh, can I say this, throw shade at other uh, marginalized groups, okay? And, that, and to think that it's okay. So guess what, when Alex comes into another meeting, you know, and I heard him get disrespected by uh, Dr. Block, well, guess what? Sarah's going to do it too, and she gets away with it, and then I to say what does it, and then it becomes a, what did I say earlier, a cancer in the organization so that with anybody who looks like Alex shows up, it's okay to throw that microaggression, that, that, that discriminatory behavior at them, and it becomes a cancer for every department. What thing we do know, making the business case is about dollars for the DEI, the DEI space, right? So if we, if we don't address it, we don't diversify. One thing we do know through our friends at the state is that the, dem the demographics of our state is going to change drastically within the next 15 to 20 years. If we are not intentional about transforming our organizations, I repeat, if we are not intentional about transforming our organizations, we bear witness to the same issues that our parents and our grandparents went through trying to integrate the workspace. So what side of history do we want to be on, my friends? We have a responsibility to, to take this conversation that Deed is putting us into this discussion and taking it serious and, and really making the normalized conversation around addressing microaggressions, addressing discriminatory behavior, a normal thing. It's not me trying to come for you out of say what well, it's me trying to help educate you on my community and what's important to me so that you can be a better student of people. One thing we also know is that people or marginalized folks, regardless of your community, we have often, if not always, assimilated to other people's cultures. Can we agree to that, right? No one has, I'll say no one, very few folks take the time in the workplace to assimilate to ours. So the whole point of addressing getting to know my authentic self and who, who and what I bring to the workplace is about you understanding me. That's all of my different layers. If I'm a man, I'm a black man from the South and I'm, 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 I'm a veteran and I'm a, I'm a I'm bisexual, I'm whatever I choose, I, I believe I am and I've grown up to be, that's what needs to be uh, communicated. And that's how you need to see me as I am. And I have to do that for everybody, not just what I see you as when I meet you on camera or I bump into you in the hallway. Wow. All right. Well, I guess, uh... I don't know how four of you can, all the four of you at the same time could mic drop, but you did that. Um, so, oh my God, so, so, so we are at the end. So let me go ahead and 
share this. Um, so well, there's a list of resources and references and also um, videos um, that we will have um, attached to this presentation for you guys to go and review and just hear what other people um other people's thoughts and opinions are on you know this topic on the code switching the cost of code switching you know microaggressions in the workplace these are all really good resources so i highly recommend you in the audience uh employers um non-employers that attended this this uh webinar to definitely um look at these resources after so um, I want to thank all four of the panelists. Thank you very much. This was really good. You guys delivered. I knew you would deliver and you delivered. Um, so thank you so much. Before we get into the unplug, I'm going to have my counterpart, um, James uh, Whirlwind Soldier, talk about next month's Workforce Wednesday topic. So James, go ahead. Thank you. And thanks to the panelists. This was really an exceptional conversation. And I'm sorry it's uh, it can't continue, but yes, I wanted to invite everybody to March's Workforce Wednesday. As always, it'll uh, it'll be happening on the first Wednesday of the month from 11 o'clock to 12, and then from 12 to 12.30, we have our unplugged session. So what are we going to be talking about next month? Um, the question we're really going to ask is, what does it mean that our work uh, for our workforce that Gen Z will be the dominant generation by 2025? Um, can we expect the values and priorities um, of this new generation to comply or fit in with with our organizational culture? Um, and can we expect them to change their values and priorities for us or do we need to change them for them? Um, last question would be is, and uh, does this paradigm shift that we talked about today in this session, will that have an impact on, on our businesses around things like market share and profitability? So again, join us on March 1st at 11.30, or uh, 11 a.m. for our, our usual time. And as we review the uh, workforce and demographic data provided by our regional labor uh, market analysts, and then invite a panel of, of experts just like today to reflect on this demographic shift and discuss how we can prepare for this new workforce. Right. Hope to see everybody there. Yes. And um, as uh, usual for the employee, the employers and the audience, um, please go to our website uh, where you can see a list and pictures of all of the workforce strategy consultants, uh, the ones in your region, and definitely reach out to them um, if you need assistance with, um, with you know, building and starting a DEI um, workforce uh, strategy for your company or any other services, any other uh, recruiting retention needs um, that you have. So with that, um, thank you very much. Um, and we will start the Q&A in about a minute. <laughs> 